if you were to wake up tomorrow, if all of us were to wake up tomorrow and the culture of nice had disappeared, how would our campuses be different? We would actually be centering the experiences of the most marginalized people on our campus. Hmm. Wow. Because, because again, right, the culture of nice seeks to center those with power. Right. It seeks to center those who already have voice. It seeks to center those who make decisions. It seeks to center those who have access to resources. Hey fam, welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I'm your host, Rochelle Pope. Today we're talking about so-called nice racism and the harm and trauma that it unleashes. We'll discuss how this plays out in student affairs and in higher education and what we can do to stop it. We'll discuss this and much more with Dr. Carlton Green. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find details about this episode or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. You can find us on iTunes, YouTube, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Stylus. Visit styluspub.com and use the promo code Student Affairs Now for 30% off and free shipping. Today's episode is also sponsored by Leadership. Go to leadership.org to learn how they can work with you to create a just, caring, and thriving world. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Rochelle Pope. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm broadcasting from Williamsville, New York, near the campus of the University of Buffalo, where I serve as a Senior Associate Dean of Faculty and Student Affairs and the Unit Diversity Officer for the Graduate School of Education. I'm also an Associate Professor in the Higher Ed and Student Affairs Program. The University at Buffalo is situated on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Haudenosaunee people. So let's get to today's conversation. Dr. Green, Carlton, thank you. Thank you for joining me today for this sure. episode of Student Affairs Now and welcome to the podcast. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Sure, no problem. Can you tell us a bit about you, your current role, a bit about your pathway through student affairs, higher education, counseling, into the work that you're doing now and launching now? Sure. So thank you again for having me. I'm Dr. Carlton E. Green. I'm a licensed psychologist in the um, Maryland, in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. We call it the DMV. Um, I am also seated on the um, unceded lands of the Piscataway people here in Largo, Largo, Maryland. So we definitely want to pay our respects to them. Um, with regards to my journey into this work, I am somebody who started out as a student activist as an undergraduate student, and that kind of got me into student affairs. So I worked for about 10 years at a, a large regional institution down in Texas, Sam Houston State University, where I did student affairs stuff. Went back to graduate school um, to study mental health counseling and ended up uh, pursuing a PhD in counseling psychology. Um, and while I was there, certainly at Boston College in that context, had a lot of opportunities to work uh, continuously with undergraduate students, be they um, in residence life or students who are coming out of the Office of Ahana student programs or even with student athletes, did quite a few things while I was at Boston College and then left there um, to be a um, intern at the University of Maryland Counseling Center to finish off my counseling psychology program. Worked for a year at the University of Houston um, in the counseling center there as a postdoctoral fellow and then came back to the University of Maryland um, to work in the counseling center for about five years. Um, most recently, the work that I have been doing is the Director of Diversity Training and Education um, at the University of Maryland, um, where I did that for about three years and then have subsequently left that work to go full time um, in independent practice for myself, um, doing private um, individual um, and couples counseling with folks here in this area, as well as serving as a speaker consultant around diversity, equity, inclusion related issues. Um, in addition to doing some consulting with um, mostly with higher education organizations mm -hmm. and sometimes with mental health settings and nonprofit organizations as well. Wow, you know, you have done so much and it's so much that is so typical of folks who begin in student affairs. Now I can't mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. all roads leave, lead 
um, through student affairs to do this kind of work. <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> yes, yes, I totally agree with that. It's interesting too to just think about um, how I ended up being a counseling psychologist as well. And there, there, at one point in my career, very early in my career, I was looking at the counseling psychology stuff and then noticing that there were a lot of counseling psychologists who were in student affairs types of roles, whether or not they are vice presidents or serving in some other type of director capacity. It's just really fascinating to think too about the overlap um, and the skills that um, are common to both student affairs and counseling psychologists. Right, right, yeah. Um, um, we have so many shared histories, um, mm -hmm. student affairs and counseling psychology in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, I was um, listening to you as you talked about your role as a uh, therapist but also as a speaker and consultant. And I've seen you in those roles and certainly heard about you in those roles. I know in the fall of 2020, which seems a long time ago, thanks to that pandemic. It does seem like a long time but ago. It's just a year ago, a year ago, you came and you spoke to the entire Graduate School of Education at my institution, the University of Buffalo, about the inherent and insidious harm and trauma of racism especially when it's dressed up in this culture of nice, as you called it. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, our students, our faculty, and our staff are still talking about that conversation. I still mm -hmm. see it show up in papers occasionally. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to begin there. Please share with our audience, what is this culture of nice, as, as you frame it? And how does it play out in higher education, particularly mm -hmm. at historically white institutions? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I come to this work, certainly as a counseling psychologist, as a trainer of other therapists. And I always like to tell this story because I think that it helps us understand how the culture of nice can play out right under our very noses, even if we aren't paying attention to it. So as a, as a therapist trainee, um, I remember being a master's level mental health counseling student at Boston College. And one of the ways that we train when we are in school is that we have so like a, a basic skills course where there will probably be 60 of us in a course. Um, and that's how many students were in my cohort. Um, probably about 50 of us were white women. And then about 10 of the, the remaining 10 of us were some combination of um, black women, um, men, men of color, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in our 60 person course, we go and we learn things like how to rephrase statements or how to practice empathy or how to um, restate right you're, you're practicing some really basic micro skills of counseling and then from there you leave the lecture and you go into what we would call a skills lab right. and the skills lab is probably about 10 of you right and you get a chance to practice in different ways whatever you just learned in the lecture you're supposed to be practicing in the skills lab so in my skills lab i think there were probably about six or seven white women and then um, the rest of us there were a couple of men and maybe a couple of women of color um, in those labs, you practice, one of the ways that you practice is what we call a fishbowl. In the fishbowl, what happens is that there can be two people in the center of the class um, or in the center of the circle, right? One playing the therapist, another playing the client. And the therapist is um, trying to do what we were just learning in the, in, the, in, the, in the lecture, right? When we would have those, this is inevitably what would happen when the fishbowl would, con would conclude my colleague sitting in the room would say to the person playing the therapist, that was amazing. You were so great at that. How did you learn how to do that? I wish that I could be a therapist as good as you, right? It would be all of these, these really, um, uh, this high praise, right. effusively high praise, right? For us who are just like first year students in a mental health counseling program, but we're, we're doing that, right? And I would often be sitting there a little bit in confusion because I would be thinking in my head, but they didn't actually practice the skills that Dr. Sparks just told us to practice, right? You didn't do what we were supposed to, what we were supposed to be doing. And so I remember being kind of befuddled by that for a little while, um, going through the first few weeks of the program. And then at one point, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I was having a conversation with my then advisor, Dr. Janet Helms. Um, um, and we were having just a brief conversation, maybe just a check-in. And I was sharing with her about this particular phenomenon. And she looked at me after I told the story and she goes, she says, oh, you didn't know? We have a culture of nice in higher education, mm. right? We don't give hard feedback to people. Um, at all, right? And something about that just really turned the light bulb on, on for me, right? And I didn't really think too much about that until years later when I started talking to folks about racial trauma and, and really trying to understand what makes this so hard 
for us to talk about, right? But if we come back to thinking about this culture of nice, the way that I've talked about it, and I really borrow that from a um, from an author, Elisha McDonald. She wrote an article called "When Nice Won't Suffice." Mm -hmm. for a trade, um, for a teacher trade organization um, or teacher, teacher trade magazine, I think a few years ago. And what the way that she described it, um, she, she kind of outlined the phenomena that occur around this, right? And um, certainly at this point, the way she was writing about it in secondary education among a group of teachers, mm -hmm. the phenomena that she describes was really that they focus on in, in their, in, in their um, interactions with each other, right? Either with teachers or with students, what they generally do is they focus on compliments or strengths. Everything has to be positive. Everything has to be positive, right? Um, they make sure that they avoid conflict at all costs in order to preserve some semblance of harmony. Even if there is disharmony occurring or even if people are having really strong negative reactions to something, there is a, a concerted effort to avoid conflict, right? Um, what she also described was sort of like, we stay at the surface level with our conversations. We don't allow anything to really go deeper or to probe into anything that could possibly make us vulnerable, okay? Um, and then the final thing that she, that she pointed out, which I actually really appreciated, because I think this, is, this may be sort of like the hallmark of what happens, especially in higher education around this, is she says that even if something negative or something that doesn't feel so harmonious breaks through, mm -hmm. the perceived difficulty is blamed on the other, right? It is never really somebody uh, almost like in the immediate conversation, but there's a way that it has to be um, located on somebody outside of this immediate interaction. Um, for example, she was talking about um, secondary um, uh, teachers and the teachers were trying to, it, this was actually, uh, she was describing professional development among them. Mm -hmm. And so the teachers are talking about their lesson plans and maybe about how a particular lesson plan didn't go over well in a, in a classroom. What the teachers who are mostly white, right? We know that 80% of teachers are, are white, especially at the secondary and elementary level. What the teachers would do when they talked about this lesson plan not going so well is they would blame a particular student in the person's class, right? right? There was no... Um, accountability on the teacher's part, or there was no sense of asking, so like, oh, so let's talk about maybe what about the lesson plan didn't work, or let's talk about maybe about the delivery, or nothing about the teacher. It was always about something about the student, right? So those four elements, to me, um, really stand out when I think about the culture of nice and higher education. Um, now, we see this whether or not you are in student affairs or you're in some, some academic space, right? Um, how it is, especially, I would, I would say from my student affairs days, we can be, um, in some ways, the heartbeat of the institution, mm -hmm. right? Um, we provide a lot of support. We provide community. Um, we are always trying to build relationships, um, helping students to build relationships. Um, what can often happen in the context of student affairs is that we will not risk talking about really difficult things um, because we want to stay focused on helping people to move forward. We want to help people to focus on their strengths. We want to help people to really develop in ways that feel like it's positive, right? Without the acknowledgement that actually you can develop in a very positive way by working through difficult things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we stay away from anything that could feel challenging or difficult or upsetting. Um, anything that might actually that our students, right? This is, this, this is actually probably a really good way of thinking about it. When our students who are always trying to help us perfect the institution, always trying to help the institution be the best institution that it can be by reminding us of the values that we say that we um, embrace or by reminding us about why it is that we brought these students here, right? Um, when our students have demands of us, we can get really um, pejorative towards those students. And we can blame those students for not being successful. We can blame those students for not um, uh, behaving in ways that are consistent with the university's values, right? We don't necessarily want to hear these demands because that feels like it's getting into something conflictual. And we don't want that, right? In academics, and in, in so like in the classroom settings, or even if you think about um, in, in a faculty meeting, for example, right? Faculty could be talking about their difficulty with recruiting or trying to talk about um, the recruiting numbers, whether or not that's recruiting graduate students of color or recruiting more faculty of color. Um, there's a way that we won't actually dig into <clears throat> the culture of the department 
or a culture of the institution and what makes that difficult, we will instead say something like, there are not enough of them. There are not enough qualified people out there. Or we offered it to this one person and um, folks went somewhere else because they, they, they just had more opportunities or they went to a city and we, right. we're in this area. Nobody really wants to come to this area. So it's just difficult for us, right? Without having a real honest conversation about what's actually happening here in this setting that we could be much more accountable for. It would risk us being vulnerable to talk about our own, own accountability. Sure. So the interesting thing that I that I heard you talk about, um, Carlton, is this is pervasive. This culture it's is pervasive. It now is. we add in the components of race mm -hmm. or other social justice issues, mm -hmm. and that changes mm -hmm. the the, um, the the I was going to say the complexion of it because it it, mm. it really complicates it, right? <laughs> no pun intended, right? Yeah. No pun intended. Um, and so I, I, I think about that. So what is that culture of nice when it's connected to race? What's going on there? Mm. How does that play out? And mm -hmm. I know you gave us a couple of examples of that. Yeah. But yeah. what happens to this culture of nice that we've created and how it harms us, keeps us from moving forward, keeps us from growing, keep, keeps us from changing our institutions? Mm -hmm. What does adding the... the, um, the race as a component of this? How does that change it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's also a really good question. So one of the things that I commonly talk about, right, is that when race drops into a conversation, even among well-meaning, really intelligent people, it actually fosters a sense of anxiety among folks, right? And people lose their minds, literally, right? You're, you're the, the part of your brain that would work to sort of like communicate and make good decisions and, um, and be present, right? It, we, that part kind of goes out of the window, right? Um, and so when race becomes a part of it, what people will default to is to me, is really trying to foster a sense of harmony, mm -hmm. right? We are all here together. Let's not focus on anything difficult. Let's not focus on anything negative. Let's really focus on the relationships that we have. Can, can, we, can we affirm each other that it's okay for us to be here in this space or that we are in this space in a way um, that is actually free of conflict? I mean, that's actually what, what people are trying to do. Like, we don't want the conflict here. Or it could be that people are showing up in ways um, there's, there's a great slide that I'm thinking of for, for presentations when I do them sometime. And I'm, I'm seeing the words right now in my head. Uh, um, people want harmony and they don't want to tell the truth. That's one of the pieces that, that, that comes out of this. Um, people really want to continue to focus on um, transactional types of relationships. Let's just get the business done rather than focusing on what would be transformative in this conversation, because that would actually mean some work has to go in. Um, and so, and if work has to go in, that means that we're really gonna have to roll up our sleeves and, and really dig in here together, right? Um, let's just stay transactional, then let's keep it nice, right? Um, the other thing that, that happens, and I think we're, and we're certainly gonna dig into some of these a little bit later. The other thing that happens when the culture of nice collides with race mm -hmm. is nobody wants to talk about the fact that somebody has been harmed. Right. We don't wanna talk about harm. We don't wanna talk about the impact. We don't wanna talk about the negative outcomes for people of color um, in these situations. So if we as a country have not been invested in really acknowledging that racism is harmful, even though people can talk about how it is that people of color encounter racism, right? And, 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 and racism can um, really affect us, right, without going into the details, right, we definitely don't want to say in a meeting, oh, our department has participated in racism, or the Department of Residence Life has done something that was racist, or the director of Fraternity and Sorority Life was complicit. Like, like, we will not have that conversation. So what we will do is that we will raise it back up to the top, and let's be nice, let's be nice to each other, right? Such that we don't have to talk about the harms and how we were complicit in harming people, right? So to me, that's one of the ways that it, that it really functions. It, it, it kind of absolves people of any responsibility of talking about how it is that we either actively or passively participate in harm. Sure. Well, what's fascinating about that to me is that it perpetuates harm. Mm -hmm. In our 
refusal to acknowledge or talk about the harm that's been caused. And we think we're being nice and, and just um, keeping the conversation civil. We never get to then saying, Do hey, not. when you act in this way, this is the harm that it causes. Right. And so right. I keep getting harmed <laughs> and you keep acting in that way. And so you're also being harmed. And so mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that goes to this question. What, what harm does the culture of nice cause to both white folks and BIPOC folks, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and it causes harm in different ways. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could share with us some of those ways. What yeah. Do, what does it, what is the harm it causes to white people around race? I'm really talking about this culture of nice as it, um, as it's dealing with race and racism on campus. And what does this culture of nice um, around racism due to BIPOC folks. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about white folks here for a second, mm -hmm. right? Um, the way that I think about doing this is that when the culture of nice shows up, what it is actually trying to do is center the experiences of white people, mm -hmm. right? Um, the moment in a race-related conversation or in a racism-related conversation, that we begin to center the experiences of white people, what we've been taught is that white people have to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. White people cannot be upset. White people should not be made to feel shame or guilty, right? And in some ways, when the culture of nice gets enacted, what it does is that it actually stymies the white person's capacity to be able to have access to their own humanity, mm -hmm. right? Um, to be able to even have access to this part of me that says, oh my gosh, I hurt another person. Mm -hmm. Let me let me sit with that. Or let me, let me acknowledge that I have hurt another person and then let me shift to focus on the harm that I've caused on this other person. Right. Right. Because in some ways, that is what we all kind of learn uh, in, in the kindergarten or first grade, right? right? You harm somebody, you apologize for the harm that you, that you caused to them. Right. But over the course of, of our lives, we get socialized, especially around race, to ignore the harm, but to focus on, especially when it comes to white people, well, it wasn't my intent to right. do that, right? And so when we, when, we, when we center intent, we are automatically in, um, centering the person who is causing the harm, right? right? So that's one thing that it does, that it denies the humanity of white people. The other thing that I think that it does is that it, if, if we, if we, this just seems logical, if we deny the humanity of white people, then the next piece is that we're going to stymie the development of white people. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna give white folks the opportunity to continue to actually develop as racialized beings in the society who can not only be accountable for how it is that racism harms uh, people of color, but we also don't give them or we don't set them up to also be in relationship with other white folks to talk about how racism harms them as well, right? right so right. there's a way that we stymie their own progressive development. Um, and then if we're stymieing people's development, what, we are, what we're ultimately doing is we're anesthetizing them um, from the pain and from the fear that goes along with, with racism. Um, we are shushing them. Right, right, technically, um, and we're shushing those feelings. And what we know, what I know as a psychologist is that um, you cannot have good, strong relationships with people without acknowledging your humanity, yep. without recognizing that re the relationships ebb and flow over the course of time, and without acknowledging that vulnerability is an important part of deepening relationships. Right, right. Right. Um, and so the culture of nice sets us up really to have white people frozen in a certain aspect of their, of their being, and it doesn't give them the opportunity to get unfrozen from that, right? Um, and so what we have when we, when we talk about harm is underdeveloped white folks who continue to do harm without any um, acknowledgement that they continue to harm people of color in ways that continue to be deleterious to society. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's this, what we think, and, and, I, and I understand that people are learning this really early, don't talk about race because it's mm -hmm. a point. And so it mm -hmm. starts there, don't notice race mm -hmm. as if it's a good thing. And then how mm -hmm. it really does psychological harm to themselves. Mm -hmm. Very much now, so. Now, the same culture of nice, and race and racism also does harm to BIPOC folks. Yes. Do that kind of harm. What is, what right. Is it right. If we if we think about um, racism, uh, if we think about the culture of nice being a um, product of racism, 
right? It's just one of the ways, um, I'll use Robin DeAngelo's language, because I think that, that when she talks about this, she says something like, what is the function of this niceness? What is the function of your silence? What is the function of this smile in the face of somebody saying that I've been racially harmed, right? I think that what she's trying to get at is that um, it actually keeps racism in place. Mm -hmm. The culture of nice keeps racism in place. And so what we have to really be thinking about is that um, not only we have to, it's almost sort of like the, the associative principle. Um, it's not necessarily the culture of nice that, that continues to be harmful. It is how racism is harmful, right? right. right. And racism harms us in ways um, that actually, especially in, in the context of higher education, right? Students can't focus. Students can't really, students, exp students experience either race-related stress or race-related trauma. And that stress or trauma manifests in sort of like poor academic performance because you can't focus, you can't sleep, you're not eating well, um, you're not able to have the types of relationships, you lose self-confidence in, in who right. you are, right? So it has really negative impacts. But maybe within classroom settings, within meeting settings, when the culture of nice evidences itself, mm -hmm. what it does is that it actually can silence people of color, right? Because we know that if a white person shows up and they act nice, and, and I should, I, I, I'll, maybe we'll come back to this later. When a white person shows up and they act nice, and if a person of color were to challenge that, then the person of color is seen okay. as being an aggressor or a, pro or a problem, right? Um, within that setting, because this person was just being nice. Why are you responding that way, right? We certainly cannot talk about the pain that we experience. And so in some ways, we have to be silent about our pain around how it is that the culture of nice and racism affect us because there are very few spaces in higher education where people of color get to say, this is harming me, mm -hmm. right? This is actually hurting my capacity for being able to function. And to me, that is about fundamentally in higher education, us not seeing that black people in particular, but other indigenous and people of color are actually human beings with mm -hmm. feelings, right? We actually perceive um, black indigenous people of color um, communities within the context of higher education as being, e I, I was trying to think about this the other day. We either perceive black indigenous people of color as being subhuman mm -hmm. or superhuman, right? right? right, right either, right, right um, you are deficient and so you should be grateful for being here. Um, and so, and therefore it's just a part of your struggle. You just gotta, you just gotta work harder. You just gotta get over whatever it is that you think is hurting you or happening to you, because that's just the way that, that you're expected to show up here. Right. Or you're superhuman, right? right? We can think about, um, black women faculty members who are doing miracles mm -hmm. on campuses, right. Through their scholarship, through their service. They are uh, mentoring loads and loads of students that are not actually their own, right? So yeah. they're, they're out here being superwoman, doing all of these things. And so for superwoman to come and say that something is hurting me, hurting her, right? That, that also is unheard of, right? right? And so the culture of nice through racism, right? Silences people of color to actually be able to talk about our pain. And so we end up feeling the really intense trauma um, and terror of racism in our bodies. And over the course of time, of course, that is going to have repercussions for how it is that either we continue in higher education or we get out of higher education, right? There, you, the, the pandemic has shown us so many, so many faculty of color, so many student affairs administrators of color are now saying enough. I just can't continue to do this anymore. Right. Well, the thing that I think, you know, you talked about how we're not allowed to talk about that or or that we don't talk about it. We or don't we don't talk about, about it. it. But the other thing is that we're punished for it when we We do. are punished. Exactly. So that you exactly. say, hey, this hurts or this was wrong. And mm -hmm. someone might try to appease, you know, mm -hmm. in that situation, but later you're labeled mm -hmm. as, as a problem. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned labeled as mm -hmm. an aggressor or... Mm -hmm. You know, any of those other words that we use for people, whiner, um, um, mm -hmm. troublemaker, whatever mm -hmm. it is, right. to, to stop those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, or somebody who is at odds with the institution, right? right? right. <laughs> you know, right. or you're just, you're just angry all the time. That's right. Um, right. Again, what that is trying to do 
is, you know, in some ways people might think, well, that doesn't fit with your definition of the culture of nice, which says that, you know, you would blame the other, right? But in that setting, in that particular setting, if there's a group of white folks or a group of people who have bought into, right, this white supremacy way of being in the institution, then what they will do, they may not do it to that person's face, right. but they may ice that person out. That's they right. may limit that person's, um, they may take them off of email chains or they don't invite them to meetings or they don't, they don't their voice is not, place. yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? yeah, All yeah, of those things can happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. That. So that's a way of othering people. That's right, far too often. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was thinking about another way that um, the culture of nice plays out, and I think you may have implied it, but I think this one needs to be stated um, real clearly, that by not giving people good information, mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about these the the BIPOC folks who aren't getting information that you're not doing this correctly. Mm -hmm. you know, this can be done better. Oh, this yes. Isn't done oh, yes. Well. Your presentation, mm -hmm. well, you can do better work than that. Mm -hmm. By this mm -hmm. failure to call that out, but having it in your head, the person's not going to be seen. They're, first of all, they're not able to grow. They're not able to develop the skills that they need. They're not able to... Um, be challenged because they're hearing from people if you're doing a good job when mm -hmm. they're not doing a good job. So, mm -hmm. for example, if I'm teaching a class and I'm the mm -hmm. one that calls this mm -hmm. student out, you know, particularly a student of color, and so, you know, they're mm -hmm. like, nobody else has a problem with my work. I go, shame on mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. you know? I, they should have mm -hmm. said, this is not, is, you can do this better. And let mm -hmm. me help you figure out how to do this better. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's such a great example too, um, Rachelle, because I actually had that experience as a doctoral student teaching a course at Boston College. Mm -hmm. I was teaching about I think forty five students in an adult psychology course, and you know Boston College is a historically white institution, mm -hmm. um, and so there were probably maybe four or five students of color in a class of 45 people, and there was a particular black woman student in my class. Um, who was struggling. She had some, she had a lot of issues going on that semester. And so there, I was giving her some grace, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was trying to expect excellence of her. Right. right. Um, and so I was giving her some feedback about her writing. And one of the things that she said to me was, nobody has ever given me this feedback about my writing before, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't sort of like, in a, nobody's given me this, thank you for this. It was, right. it was in a very angry way, like, right. um, what are you doing here, right? Um, and, I, and I just simply <laughs> said to her, like, well, you never had me as an instructor before, right? right. Um, and so what, you, what you're highlighting is that even in a situation like that one, the culture of NICE per, um, prevails because more often than not, faculty who can have low expectations of people of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, do not rise to the occasion to actually give meaningful feedback that will support that person's development, right? right. Because they fear that they will be called racist. Right. And there is nothing more terrifying for a white person in this country than to be called racist. Not so in order doing racism, but not doing racism, racism, but call the racist. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll do racism. Racism. Mm -hmm. That's OK. But don't call right. me a racist. That's right. Fair. Right. Right. Because I think that what you're highlighting that people don't actually get is that to not give the feedback is a racist act. Right. Right. To not give the feedback is a racist act because it is embedded in a culture of, of or a, 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 a theory of low expectations that people of color just don't perform well. So this is the best that I got from them. So this is all they're really capable of, right? right. And so then they can't develop the skills to then be the person that you really recommend for mm -hmm. the position because mm -hmm. you don't really think they're that good. And you mm -hmm. have to allow them mm -hmm. to be good. Right. One other way that this shows up, I mean, it could, for people to be able to understand that this isn't just about students. Right. This is also about faculty and staff, right? right. So a person of color um, staff member does something. Right. Um, they they post something on social media mm -hmm. or they um, show up to the office in a way that doesn't necessarily comport with white supremacy. So like professional standards. Right? right. Instead of somebody saying, hey, can we talk about this so that so that I can get an understanding and or I need to give you some feedback about right. how this is affecting your the perception of you or even your opportunities for advancement or even your development here what people will do is they'll just go silent. Right. And then eventually, right, deny them opportunities for advancement or 
they begin to leave them out of conversations or they don't facilitate professional connections for them. Again, having sort of like these really um, white standards about what professionalism can look like. And we don't necessarily have honest conversations with people because we're afraid of the conflict that might come from right. that, or we're afraid of, that we'll that we'll be labeled racist again, right? That is also a form of niceness that then sabotages um, the professional trajectories of, of faculty and staff of color. Right, and again, um, denying them their own agency. So mm -hmm. I will tell you what the culture around here is like, what mm -hmm. people consider professional. Now you make your own decisions about how you're going to dress or act or whatever, but I want you to at least have the information. And instead mm -hmm. we withhold the information mm -hmm. and then hold them accountable for it. Yes, yes. That's really yes. powerful. So mm -hmm. let me, um, I, I, I have just two more questions for us. The first is, and I don't know, I, I, I just think it's a sort of fun question because I often believe that if we don't know where we want to be, mm -hmm. you know, that whole old saying, if you don't know where you're going, Mm -hmm. um, you don't know when you get there, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this sort of um, miracle question. Mm. And, um, if you wake up tomorrow, if you were to wake up tomorrow, if all of us were to wake up tomorrow and the culture of nice had disappeared, how would our campuses be different? Mm. I think that maybe this is, this may be a way of, of summing it up we would actually be centering the experiences of the most marginalized people on our campus. Mm. Wow. Because, because again, right, the culture of nice seeks to center those with power. Right. It seeks to center those who already have voice. It seeks to center those who make decisions. It yeah. seeks to center those who have access to resources. Right. But if the culture of nice were not there and we were more free, Mm -hmm. to talk about harm, to talk about inequitable outcomes, to talk about the pain that we know our Black women faculty and staff are experiencing, mm -hmm. to talk about the difficulties of Indigenous people of even getting into our institutions. Mm -hmm. We would actually really be talking about those yeah. and not only talking about those, but integrating those into how we think about our strategic planning for the institution. Sure, yeah. We would be redoing our course curriculum to say, there's been a time, there was a time for us to, to, to talk about these classics and these white men, right? <laughs> um, but we are moving towards a different society. What would it be like to teach the voices of um, Harlan, Harlan Renaissance, Renaissance poets in the classroom and that's that's what we were teaching right? not as the elective but right. as the the um required course right mm -hmm. right right um what would it look like if in fact we said to our students you have to take courses on anti-racism mm -hmm. because that is what will actually help you to move through and become good citizens in the world right, right? What if we said, right, to our faculty that it is your responsibility not only to show up to teach about theory, but you've got to also figure out how to teach about practice. Mm -hmm. I know this has not been what you have, have you, you have done across the, the um, course of your career, but we need to be switching some things to give people strategies and practices for being able to engage across difference. Right. And not only are we gonna do that, but we're going to center the experiences of those who are oftentimes harmed in these conversations, right. right? It is the culture of nice, again, that actually keeps our current functioning in place. Um, one of the things that, again, to reference Robin D'Angelo's work is that she highlights that individualism sort of like lies at the heart of, right. of the culture of, 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 of what she calls nice racism, but I said the culture of nice, right? Individualism really lies at the heart of that we have allowed our institutions to really focus on the needs of the individual without thinking about the needs of the communities that are being um, harmed, the right. communities that are being left behind, 
right? The communities that are suffering um, because of economic woes or mental health crises, we have not actually been, been talking about those, not only um, in a way that says we have some responsibility to those communities, right. but also let's talk about the strengths of those communities, right? Yeah. Um, because we, we just don't think in, the, in, the, in that type of way, when we're talking about um, people's experiences, we have reverted to the individual. And as long as we keep centering the individual, we will always focus on the intent of the individual, which means that as long as an individual is being nice, we won't necessarily see them as being harmful um, in situations. We won't hold them accountable right. for how it is that they participate in racism or other forms of oppression, right? So the miracle would be, we would, we, would, we would reorient ourselves to how we actually do higher education. We would center the most marginalized and we wouldn't actually center the needs of the individual. We would be thinking more in terms of what are the needs of our communities. Right, wow, that is so powerful. That's so powerful. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at the time and thinking we need to end and um, that's, that's almost, you know, if that's not your final thought, I'm scared because that was so deep. But I wanted to give you a chance to say, you know, like, what, what is something we maybe didn't get to, something else you'd like to add to this conversation? But I have to go back mm -hmm. and say how powerful that was. That was just mm -hmm. amazing. It may be actually um, just building on that, right? Um, so many of our institutions of higher education have actively begun to talk more about our histories with both colonization and slavery, mm -hmm. right? Um, really trying to acknowledge that we sit on land that was stolen from indigenous people, that we have as institutions been actively participating in erasing indigenous people, mm -hmm. that the hands of the enslaved built many of our institutions, even as we were denying those enslaved people or their descendants access to education. Like we, we have been doing a good job of that, right? Which in some ways could be an indication that we're violating the culture of nice. Right. Because we are implicating ourselves historically in a lot of these harms. Um, and we are implicating ourselves actually in racial terrorism, mm -hmm. right? I think though, that the next big step for institutions, which I think will <laughs> be really hard, is for us to talk about how it is that we are currently complicit mm -hmm. in racism, not historical, right? There is a way that these historical efforts actually seem to be like, oh, look at what we're doing now. Right. Right. Let's give ourselves a pat on the back because we have acknowledged the history of slavery, because we've created these scholarships for black and indigenous people, because we are bringing back um, the descendants of the folks who built the institute. Like, like we're, 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 we're good right now with looking back on the, on the historical pieces. But in order to really disrupt the culture of nice, mm -hmm. it becomes really important for us to talk about currently, how we and our positions of leadership are complicit in creating um, alternative spring break, break programs that still go in and basically colonize people of color communities, mm -hmm. right? Without actually holding our students accountable for doing the necessary self-reflection. Both about how, and after, <laughs> right. Exactly, right? About how not only, right, racism was present, but what have you been doing that has been contributing to this over the course of right. your short life, right? right? right. Um, if in fact, we don't invite our fraternities and sororities into conversations about not only how historical racism has been present, but what are we doing to okay. limit the participation of black indigenous, other people of color in some of these historically white organizations, right? Um, there has to be a way, not, and, and, and I want to really be clear about this too. It's not only, the organizations and the departments. Right. Leaders right. have to step in and say, that was a bad decision. Right. That came from my own racialized perspective. And now I recognize how I was, compl I was complicit in racism when mm -hmm. this occurred, right? right? That would, I think, would begin to revolutionize this, this culture of nice. Because a part of what is happening, I think, is that um, 
Nobody sees models for how that can be done. And if we don't have people breaking ranks to right. say, actually, I was complicit. Right. I participated. I, unintention I unintentionally did this. But right. nevertheless, I did this, right? Right. Um, if, if we don't have that um, occurring in higher education, we're still going to be stuck and the culture of nice will still be pervasive. Right. I want to say one other thing too, Rochelle, because I, I think this is also important. We also have to recognize that it's not just white people who participate in the culture of nice. Yes. We have to recognize that as people of color, some of us with less racial consciousness, underdeveloped racial identity perspectives, mm -hmm. we actually support and affirm and actually embolden the culture of nice right. because white folks can look around at us and see that we are also um, trying to be smiley and nice in the face of racism. And they think, well, well, that black person did it so, it, so it must be okay, right? In the face of racism, right? Or we have to also really recognize that when we have senior leaders who sit either at the presidential level or the vice presidential level of the institution, there is a way that we need to really understand that we have dangled the carrots of white supremacy in front of them. Right. And they are going to, in some ways, be intoxicated by the accoutrements of, so like being in those spaces. These institutions are historically white. They have been built on white advantage, white benefit, right? Um, sometimes trying to say we are doing the people of color the favor by bringing them here, right? Right. Um, but more often, but, but, but these institutions are historically white and, and, and that's, that's, that's a part of the culture. We need more people of color leaders at the senior level who are also willing to buck a lot of the culture of nice to really bring attention to how racism functions as a system on our campuses. If in fact we don't have, if, if those folks who move into those presidential roles or those vice presidential roles, certainly are a lot of the CDOs out there tend to be people of color, right? And there are some who are actually out there doing some really good work, but there are also some who don't necessarily call attention to the systems of oppression, the systems of harm that are really endangering um, people of color. What they do is they trade in the culture of nice in order to keep their white colleagues comfortable, in order to keep their jobs, which in fact harms our people of color communities on our college, um, on our college campuses. So that's also a big shift that has to occur. Right, that, that racism affects us all. And our mm -hmm. own answer for um, BIPOC folks, it's that internalized racism. Mm -hmm. What we learned about ourselves, what we learned about others and what we learned about um, um, appeasing the system. Yes. As opposed to, um, there are times when we need to state what we see. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's our role, it's our responsibility. It is our role. To say, mm -hmm. This is how we can respond to this. This is how we can mm -hmm. fix this. We mm -hmm. have to be the truth tellers. We have to be the truth tellers in the room, right? Um, I think that there is, I, I just want to follow up on your word. Not only do we appease white people, right? Not only are there folks in, in those roles who appease white people, there are folks who are taking care right. of white people, right? But instead of taking care of the most marginalized, we're spending mm -hmm. more time taking care of those with, with power. Mm -hmm. with exactly. Mm -hmm. we, we are actually colluding with them. Um, one of the ways that I've been thinking about this, and, I, and, I, and there's an article out that I really, or a chap, book chapter out that I want to get to pretty soon, is talking about CDOs. Um, and I think that that person may be using the, um, uh, the analogy of um, being an overseer. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you, you, you might even know which article I'm talking about, right? There are ways that um, people of color who show up in these senior leadership positions with their underdeveloped racial identity perspectives, their internalized racism, what they actually do is they function as overseers mm -hmm. and they actually quell the energy, the perspective, the ideas, the liberatory ideas of people of color, right? In favor of just maintaining the status quo. Right, right. And that is so dangerous. Mm -hmm. It is so dangerous. I'm so glad you pointed that out. I'm so glad, you know, actually, I'm just so thrilled to have been in conversation with you to share this space. I do know that if I had a little bit more time, I would go back to something that you dropped in the, in the, in the, in just your introduction and in talking about how Janet Helms, the amazing <laughs> Janet Helms, 
Yes, yes. Dear yes. Janet Helms yes. was your um, uh, dissertation advisor. And what an amazing mm -hmm. um, experience mm -hmm. that was. And, uh, and, and her work so entered into the work of student affairs and, mm -hmm. and counseling psychology. So mm -hmm. I still want to thank you for this conversation. Mm -hmm. You always fill up my brain. And I'm so grateful for your time and your contributions to this conversation. You know, to our listeners, um, we hope that you found this conversation and all of the Student Affairs Now conversations, they make a contribution to the field and that they're restorative to the profession. If you're listening today and are not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com. Scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. And while you're there, check out our archives. And if you found this conversation helpful, please share, 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 share it on your social media platforms and share it with your colleagues and students. Also, please subscribe to the podcast, invite others to subscribe, share on social media or leave a five star review. It really helps conversations like this reach more folks and build a real learning community. I want to also acknowledge and send real appreciation to the amazing and unflappable Nat Ambrosi, who does our behind the scenes productions. Thanks, Nat. I really appreciate your work. Finally, I want to give another shout out to our sponsors. We really appreciate your support. Today's episode was sponsored by Stylus, and Stylus is proud to be a sponsor of the Student Affairs Now podcast. Please browse their student affairs, diversity, and professional development titles at styluspub.com and use the promo code SANOW for 30% off all books plus free shipping. You can also find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Stylus Pub. Leadership, our other um, sponsor today, partners with colleges and universities to create transformational leadership experiences, both virtual and in person for students and professionals with a focus on creating more just, caring and thriving world. Leadership offers engaging learning experiences on courageous dialogue, integrity, equity, resilience and community building. To find out more, please visit www.leadership.org forward slash virtual programs or connect with leadership on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Again, I'm Rochelle Pope and thanks to Dr. Carlton Green. You should really check out his work. He's an incredible consultant and speaker. And I want to thank everyone else who's watching. You know, Shirley Chisholm has been on my mind lately and especially this quote, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. Folks, let's get to it. We got some ideas to implement. Till next time.